Hi everyone, um, I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy librarian at the Maine State Library. And today I'm gonna to talk about tracing your Irish ancestors. So what I'm going to do is share my screen. Um, this is mostly in a PowerPoint, um, but there are a couple of places I'll be flipping to websites to um, show you in more detail. I will say, um, Come on, you can go into the slideshow. Um, we are in much better shape now for Irish records than we were even five years ago. Um, Ireland seems to have finally figured out that if records are available, people will use them and then will come to Ireland to see where their ancestors lived. Um, so things are going online and a fair percentage of what's going online is going on for free. Not all of it, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is at places like the um, National Library of Ireland or the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland are called PRONI. Um, and so they're going online free, which is a really nice word for Scots Yankee, thrifty me. <laughs> I mean, I'm half New England Yankee and half Scots. So, you know, any money I don't have to spend is a good thing. So I'm gonna start out with a bit of background. And most, basically I'm gonna talk about Irish history from the standpoint of what's going to affect either the records that were generated to begin with or what records survive today. So I'm completely simplifying Irish history. I know that. But I, I want to do a brief overview so those of you who don't know much about the history understand where some stuff is coming from. Does that make sense to everybody? So first of all, the first question we have is exactly what is Ireland? And that's a tricky question. The entire Ireland, Ireland of Ireland is now divided between two countries. Um, I expect most of you were old enough that like me, you lived through the 60s and 70s where the first international story most nights on the news was about the troubles in Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, so you can see here the map on the, let me turn on the pointer so that, um, this part of the island of Ireland is still part of the UK and most of the records there are based in Belfast, although not exclusively. And you're going to also have to look at records in England because it's part of the UK. The rest of the Ireland, island is the Republic of Ireland that became its own country in 1922, and that's an important date for records as well. We'll get back to that. Um, Ireland had been part of the UK and under English control for centuries. Um, there were various laws in place put in place by the English government to um, manage the population as they saw it. So um, they regulated the Catholic religious hierarchy. Um, in 1704, there was an act to um, forbid Catholics from buying land or leasing more than 30 years. Um, and Catholic owned estates at that point had to be divided among all male heirs. So you couldn't keep a larger farm together. If you had three sons, you had to split the farm three ways. Um, and again, it was for dealing with um, basically keeping the native Irish population out of power. Um, the next big thing that happened um, was, and I'm gonna come back to some of the plantation, 
it's called the plantation in Northern Ireland. But let me talk a bit about the famine, mid 1840s. The population of Ireland in 1841 was 8 million. Um, in 1921, it was 4 million for the same area, which is a significant difference um, of people um, migrating somewhere else as well as dying. Um, it's time of the famine. Out of those 8 million people, 1.5 million came to the US. 350,000 went to Canada, and a similar overall number, close to, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half to two million, moved to the cities of Scotland and England. So you will see entire pages of people in the 1851 census in places like Glasgow and Liverpool, where, you know, you have entire pages of people being born in Ireland. In 1891, 43% of the people born in Ireland who were alive at that time were not living in Ireland. So almost half the population that had been born in Ireland in the previous 75 years had moved away. Um, 1916 is the start of the real Irish um, independence movement effectively, but it started earlier and there'd been a lot of land reforms in the late um, 1800s. There's a great episode of the British version of Who Do You Think You Are that talk where a woman is tracing her family's activity in the land reform movement. Um, you can often find that one. I will see if I can get the name of the person. Um, and it's at YouTube. Um, the War of Independence was from 1919 to 21, right after World War I. Um, there was an Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921 that created what was then called the Irish Free State versus um, the what's now Northern Ireland. Um, you get a civil war after that. Um, from June of 1922 to May of 1923. And that's when you get, um, if you saw the movie Michael Collins, that's where you get the Irish Free State Army versus the anti-treaty IRA. And it's way more than I can talk about now. But it's um, something to be aware of because in 1922, a lot of the Irish records were stored in Dublin in a building that also happened to store a munitions um, inventory. And so when that was set on fire, the building went up. And so 19th century Irish records, a lot of the Church of Ireland records, which was the official state church, so those were considered state records, were all destroyed. So that's, um, that's the basic summary. Um, it is interesting now, and I don't know what's gonna happen with Brexit, but when I was last in Ireland four or five years ago, if you take the bus from Dublin, which I did, up to Donegal here, you used to, before, um, various matters changed in the, you know, with the trees in the 1990s, you had to go over here and up. Now you just go straight this way. And the only way you can really tell the difference, there's no checkpoints. The only really way you can tell the difference is that you've gone from Ireland where the post boxes by the side of the road are green to the UK where the post boxes are red and where the price of a liter of gas is in pounds instead of in euros. So um, it was quite dramatic a difference for you. Know, and you know, to stand on the walls of Derry, London Derry, which they still can't agree on the name for, that you know, 
were literally the headlines for violence through my childhood in the 1970s is quite, and you know, the, now the bit, your biggest danger is bored schoolboys running around. It's quite the uh, um, dramatic difference. Um, and so it's, it's interesting um, to be there. Um, so anyway, 1922, four courts um, building in Dublin, which held the public record office in late June. The IRA barricaded themselves. Things literally blew up. Um, as I said, census records, wills, Church of Ireland records. So I'm going to talk some about how to get around those. The other big thing, and one reason you have all of this issue with um, Northern Ireland is this, and this is not a great map, um, but in the 15 and 1600s, um, the British monarch encouraged people from mostly the lowlands of Scotland, but some from England to migrate to what they called plantations in the Ulster province, which is the north eastern part of the Irish island and is now Northern Ireland. Um, the idea was to pacify and civilize Ulster with good Scottish farmers instead of rebellious, good Scottish Presbyterian farmers rather than the um, rebellious Irish Catholic natives. It also gave the king a cheap way to reward supporters with land. Especially since it, at this point, James I had moved from Scotland after he inherited the English throne to Ireland, and that way he could you know, reward the people who'd helped him in Scotland. Um, so you can see it was mostly that area. Here's another map, and you can see this is under, um, under James in the red. Um, Mary and Elizabeth also did some, and some of this was done privately. People who owned land in um, huge estates in both Scotland and Ireland moved their, um, their tenants there, again, as a way to um, make money and to um, deal with Irish political stuff. And what happened here? That's interesting. Hang on for a second. Well, anyway, the big thing that you really need to know, this is, I want to talk a little bit about the geography of Ireland. And you had these four traditional kingdoms, um, as you can see by the three, diff the four different colors. Those really don't matter that much. The things you're going to be wanting to look for is you look for where your ancestors came from. Are the townland or the parish? And there are approximately 65,000 townlands in Ireland. They range from less than an acre to several thousand acres. Um, supposedly it was enough land to keep a cow. So the smaller ones were more likely to be fertile soil and the ones that were um, just rocky land with a few little scrub brushes were larger. Um, the Ordnance Survey, which is the British um, mapping organization that's equivalent to the USGS, um, standardized the townlands in the, in the 1830s. And some number of these, usually five to 30 of them, were then grouped into a civil parish. And so you're going to get cases where you actually have a location that is in three parishes, which may or may not have the same name. One Church of Ireland, one Catholic Church, and one civil government. And often they have mostly the same borders, but sometimes they're not the same. So you know, the Catholic and civil parishes 
in particular often have the same name but not quite the same boundaries. Um, the names can vary considerably. Um, and so you will, because you have the interplay of Irish being not much of a, a written language when these were standardized, and you get some anglicized, some not. Um, and then parishes were organized into counties. Um, and they follow late Anglo-Norman 12th century boundaries, um, most of which have some level of geographic reason why they're um, that the way the shape they are. Um, so let's now that I've given you kind of the overview of the context of the records, let's take a look at how you access the records. Large numbers of the records are either in Dublin or Belfast. A lot of records, on the other hand, are still in local control, either by the county or parish. So you have county churches and libraries. Um, sorry, on the county level, you have archives, libraries, and heritage centers. And on the parish level, you have archives and churches. Um, and so a lot of it will be for you figuring out where things are. The pictures here, this is the National Library of Ireland with the nice blue sky. Um, I actually that day did not spend the whole day in the archives um, or the library, sorry, because it was such a nice day. I actually only spent half a day and went back for the full day the next day when it was cloudy and rainy. This yellow building is actually um, the county library for Donegal in, um, in Letterkenny, which is the, the county seat. Um, the other thing to notice is that um, things aren't necessarily where you'd expect them versus for Dublin versus Belfast. Um, some of the things I'm going to show you, you would think would be in Belfast because it's Northern Ireland, but because they were generated in the 1800s, the records are actually in Dublin because that's where the British government of the time sent them. Um, so in addition to the National Library of Ireland, there's the National Archives of, Lund of, of Ireland in um, Ireland and then in, in um, Northern Ireland, you have the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, which is basically the archives, the General Register Office, which is the, the civil registration. And there are a couple big other things to be aware of. The Ulster Historical Foundation has a lot of records, especially for people who emigrated to the US and Canada. There's a very large and active Presbyterian Historical Society that has records. Um, in Belfast, there's something called the Linen Hall Library that has records. And um, the Church of Ireland also has an archives that covers both Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, so that's just sort of the range of what we're looking at of where the records are. So let's take a look at birth marriages and death records. So, you know, in most places, I just tell you, you know, civil registration started on this date. Well, Ireland did things a little differently. They started civil registration for non-Catholic marriages, but nothing else in 1845. All births and deaths and Catholic marriages were added to the need for civil registration of those events in 1864. Um, in 1861, about 80% of the population of the whole Ireland, of the whole island, north and south, was Catholic. 10% um, 
was Church of Ireland, and the rest was various other denominations. Um, you had Presbyterians, Methodists, Quakers. Um, the Baptists never really caught on, um, although there were a few Baptist churches, especially in, in Northern Ireland, not North, in, in, in Donegal, Tyrone, that area, which is the Northwestern corner. Um, the more upper class a family was, the more likely they were to be Church of Ireland. Um, but there's no real way to predict from a name, um, like the, what should have been my surname except for an adoption. McGee could be either. So up until the 1870s, when it was disestablished, the Church of Ireland was the established state church. And it's part of the Anglican Communion, so it's essentially the Church of England in Ireland, or the Episcopal Church in Ireland, using the U.S. terms. In 1876, after the disestablishment, they, the, all of the records were um, supposed to be sent from the Church of Ireland churches, which recorded their own events and sometimes other non-Church of Ireland rec events because it was the local official church, were supposed to be sent to Dublin. Um, those that had good storage facilities were able to keep theirs. Some kept copies. About two thirds were actually sent to Dublin. And those almost thousand registers were destroyed in 1922. So what does survive for Irish records? For the Church of Ireland, you get um, records that were still in the hands of the local clergy, and those are distributed in various ways. Some are still with the local parish, some are in the National Archive, some are in the, with the, the Church of Ireland's representative church body library, which is their archives, and some are in the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, in Belfast. Um, some, there is a huge file that lists all of these. Um, and if you, that, that Prony puts out of where things are. The other things that survive are some of the things I talked about a couple weeks ago with the parish church records or the parish chest records. So you get some of the poor relief records, the bastardy bonds, the vestry minutes, those were not sent to Dublin in most cases. The issue is many of those are still in local control. So you need to figure out what the local parish was. And as I said, they, because they were the, the established church, there are, there were, there are records in the surviving records for people who were not Church of Ireland, um, especially for Methodists, because the Methodists were mostly circuit preachers at the time we're looking at, and so they would have often just gone to you know, register their marriage with the, with the Church of Ireland. Because of the discrimination against both Catholics and Presbyterians were also discriminated against in the same way Catholics were until the middle of the 1800s. Um, many parishes did not keep records at all. So this is in contrast to places like Germany and Italy where the Catholic Church and, and Quebec where the Catholic Church kept really good records. Um, early surviving records tend to be from either the East Coast around Dublin that was more prosperous or pockets in the West where some traditional Gaelic scholarship had survived. Um, by the early 19th century, you do get a lot kept and survived. Um, and they are microfilmed and at the National Library of Ireland. Some of them are more comprehensive than others. These microfilms have been digitized, but not indexed yet. Some other organizations are working on indexes and the records are free, but the indexes, if it's another organization, are often behind a paywall. Um, there are pre-1900, 1150 or so known Catholic registers and about 1,060 of those have been microfilmed 
up through the 1880s and are at the National Library of Ireland. The Presbyterians were strongest in, in the area settled by the Scottish plant, planters, so Ulster. Um, they were also discriminated against. Their um, records tend to start about 1820. They're often with the congregation still um, or the Presbyterian Historical Society. And some have been microfilmed in there at, at Prony, although I don't think they're online yet. Last time they checked, they weren't. Um, the Methodists that were there in Ulster, um, if they kept, if the itinerant ministers kept records there at Prony, Quaker records are a different story that I'm going to cover next week. Um, and there is a Friends Historical Library in Dublin. And there's also a Religious Society of Friends archive in Northern Ireland. Um, civil registration, as I said, starts in 1845 for Protestant marriages, 1864 for everything else. Um, they compiled them in Dublin, but then returned the records to the local authority. The early ones from 1864 to I think the 1940s are indexed at Family Search and at Find My Past. Um, some of them are also at rootsireland.ie. Um, so they're in um, either the local authority or the General Register Office of Ireland or the General Register Office of Northern Ireland starting in 1922. So what do you get if you find a record? Well, they're pretty similar to what we've seen other places. Um, by the late 1700s, you get pre-printed forms. You get um, the child's name, the father's name, the date of birth, the date of christening, and which church it was in. Um, you'll see in some of these they give, in these they all give the mother's first name, but not her maiden name. So it's better than England was with no mother's name on some of these, but less good than Scotland where women kept their maiden names. Um, same thing, pretty basic burial records. Church records, you may get a bit more especially um, the witnesses um, or sponsors or cautioners, depending on that. So you're getting um, more detail. You may get an occupation for the father um, or a townland name in some cases, which is very helpful for st distinguishing one Patrick Murphy from another or one Michael Sullivan from another. Um, so, that's the sort of thing you're going to get. Civil registration, the forms look very much like what you see in England because it's essentially England at the same time. Um, this is one, it's George Nichols and Sophia Doolittle. It just says they're full age. Sometimes it'll say 21. And if it says 21, you wanna be skeptical because they may have been 21 or they may have put 21 as this person's at least 21 and free to marry without parental permission. Whether they were um, widow, widower, spinster, bachelor, profession, where they lived at the time. Um, so they give the townland and the parish, the father's name and the father's occupation, and sometimes you will actually get the actual signatures. Other times I like this because it, even if it's still the same um, clerk's handwriting, so sometimes I've discovered that one of these is easier to read than the other. You know, he, the, the minister rushed this one and took his time on, or the, the registrar rushed this one and took his time on this one. So, um, that gives you an idea of what you'll find on that. And other than this, the, the um, as I said, the, the 
these records will look very similar to what we saw in England two weeks ago. And the, the birth and death records are the basically the same pre-printed form with the same information, except you just have one father instead of two. The census schedules do survive. Um, for 1901 and 1911. Um, they're online, they're free. Um, unfortunately, 1821 to 1851 were destroyed in the Irish Civil War in 1922. And 1861 to 1891 were actually pulped by the government to save space and to reuse the paper during World War I. Um, it was interesting, in, in 1841, um, they graded houses into four categories, and the, the lowest level were windowless mud huts with very little furniture. There was one townland in Donegal that had 900 people, and the, the statistics still survive from 1841, although the, the returns don't. The townland had 900 people, and those 900 people among them had 93 chairs and 243 stools. So that'll tell you that some, you know, some of them were poor. Um, 1901 and 1911, you had door-to-door -door enumerators. You see this form instead of a, um, a big ledger book, so it's, one family per form. And they said these are indexed at the National Library of Scotland or the National Library of Ireland. Very good index and they're free. The other thing they did is in addition to the family form, they did a house and building form. And so you get the person here and you get um, details about the house, about um, you know, was it a separate house? Was it a room in a tenement? Um, how many people were there? What quality land it was? And it can give you an idea, if you look at several pages of these near to where your ancestor lived, it can give you an idea of, you know, was your ancestor living in a fairly nice place for the area? Or was it, you know, the falling down house at the edge of town that nobody wanted to admit to living in. So these are also with the same census records. So fortunately, these aren't as good as other things, but there are some census substitutes that, and most of these are online. Um, I'm gonna come back to some of these. I'll talk very briefly about three of them. The other early censuses, there are cases where there are parish censuses, or um, either civil or religious parish, you get um, in the 1790s, there was a linen tax. Um, and so again, all of these substitutes don't list people in families. You're usually just getting one person with, but you can still sometimes trace a family through a particular townland through these to figure out who they are. There are city directories starting in, in the early 1800s um, for anything that was a decent sized city or town. The one exception to the um, federal or the, the national censuses from the 1800s not surviving is when Ireland started having an old age pension right before World War I, a lot of people had to prove their age. The same thing happened in the US, by the way, with the 1880 census when Social Security started in the 1930s. The first index for the um, US federal census was actually done by the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s of the 1880 census and it was really looking only at households with children under 10 because they, that the assumption was they were the ones who would be trying to claim social security and needed proof of their age. 
And so the same thing happened in Ireland that in the years from about 1905 to 1915, people could write to the pension authority and say, we lived at this location in 1841 and 1851, and the pension authority would check with the Census Bureau and see if there was indeed a listing for that family at that location that listed that person. Um, and if it did, they copied the details, and those copies survive at, for Northern Ireland, they're at Prony, and they're at the National Archives in Dublin for Ireland. Um, and some of those have been indexed and are put online at the National Library of Ireland. Um, Ireland required dog licenses for most dogs in the 1800s. And so because of the lack, you know, this is not the first thing, you know, someone like Ancestry or Find My Past microfilms and digitizes, but it's a snapshot of where somebody lived at a particular time. And so those are um, digitized and indexed from most of Ireland and at Find My Past, which is a pay-per-view site that's heavily Irish and British records. You can do a month subscription at a time, which is what I do. About every six months, I do a one month subscription and um, have kept track of everything I want to look up. Um, so that's, that's worth doing. Um, if you have Irish ancestors. So let's look at these. The first two, Griffith's Valuation and the Tithe Plotment books are um, basically tax records. The Tithe Plotment books were done in the 1820s. Remember, the Church of Ireland was the established church. And so they got tax proceeds. And this is looking at who owed taxes. Um, and these taxes ended in 1838. They were based on the average price of oats and wheat between in a couple years either side of 1820. They're organized by town land and the occupiers um, who owed money. And they, you'll see here, it's kind of hard to see, but they have land divided by first class, second class, third class, and fourth class. And the amount of tax um, went from two shillings, one pence for first class land down to several pence um, for fourth class land. Um, and so if you had better land, you paid a higher tax, which you know, those of us who own lakefront property in Maine because our parents bought it before we were born, know full well that land that is considered more valuable is taxed more highly. Um, some people were exempt. Many of the large estates owned by the, the nobility and gentry that um, were used as grazing land were exempt, but small potato farmers weren't. So this has the, it was awful for our ancestors, but it has the advantage for us as researchers that the poorer that somebody was, the more likely they were to owe money, which means the more likely they are to be in these records, which may be the only existing records of the family in the 1820s, whereas the big landed estates had huge amounts of records. The National Archives of Ireland has the original of these, and they've microfilmed them for the counties that make up Northern Ireland, and those are at Crony. These are being put online. As you can see, I took this from online. Um, Griffith's valuation is interesting. So the, the Tithe Plotment books are essentially the 1820s. Griffith's valuation is looking more from the late 1840s to the early 1860s. And um, it's essentially 
what John Grenham, who, write, who wrote, literally wrote the book on Irish genealogy, calls a snapshot in the aftermath of a cataclysm. So these go from the middle of the um, famine until later. There are, um, these were kept up until the 1960s, but they're not online. It's only the, the early ones up until the mid 1860s that are online. Um, your land had to be worth um, originally three or five pounds that eventually went down to all dwellings. Um, so um, you don't get the real poorest of the poor on this. Um, they did keep track over and change over the years. Um, and so you will get annotations when the owner changes um, or new building was added. The field books that have those are divided between the National Archives of Ireland and Prony. Um, the National Archives of Ireland has the, the tenure books which detail the landlords and leases and the surveyor's notes and the records of rents paid. Um, so, and the other thing is if you had a household that had several people renting rooms on an equal basis, you know, one of them was not the householder, um, they would choose one of the people in the house at random. So if you have somebody who was just, um, and that's more of an issue in cities and towns than in um, rural areas. And so again, you get um, who is occupying the land, the reference on the map for the town land, which is nice, and I'll show you a bit about that in a minute. You have the, these are the occupiers, these are the people who could basically control the land, they may not outright own it, they may have rented a small estate from one of the great landed estates. The description of what's there, so some of these are land, some are house and land. Um, the area, how much is taxable, and the total valuation of what's taxable, like adding these two together. Um, so let's go, I'm going to stop sharing this screen for a minute. Any questions at this point? I know there's a lot of information here. I'm working with the State Library's web guide to get a good place where I can just put these slides up as well as putting the presentation up so that you can flip through them at your leisure at some point. So I'm now going to share my screen to this wonderful website. Where is it? Um, I think it's this one. Yeah. This is askaboutireland.ie slash Griffith valuation. And this is fascinating because here's what you can do with this website. Um, oops, where I've lost things here. I tried to click the wrong thing. Yeah, you guys get warts and all with the technology here, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I'm interested in this family named Arthur, who lived in the western part of County Tyrone. And so I'm going to hit search. And from other records, I'm really interested in this William Arthur living in Kappa Parish. And if I click here, I get the transcription. So we have William Arthur, Landlord's name is Samuel Galbraith, gives the, the location. So this town land is Lisnaharney. Um, this is from 1860. Um, map reference one, position on page 34. So if I did this right, this is now that map. These take a while to generate, which is why I generated it before. Um, I came on. 
And you can eventually, it takes some work, but you can usually find where, so here's that number 34 here. Can you see where my cursor is right in the middle of the page? Now here's the part that's the magic and I love this. So this is the map done in the 1860s. Okay. See this scroll thing up here? Watch what happens as I move it towards the modern map. There's the modern map with the old map underlaid. So you can then figure out where this 34 is on Google Maps. And um, you can go like this so it's about half and half. And you can switch to the satellite map. And I'm going to do the historic map a little higher. There's a road here that follows this curve from the 1860 map. That curve is still there. You can see cases where the modern fields, look at this here. Let me see if I can blow this up so you guys can see it better. Look, this modern field still follows that 1860s line. And so you get, you know, obviously the, the major roads haven't changed that much, but you get this sort of, isn't this amazing? I mean, to me, this is amazing. And you can then find this place on Google Maps and um, go, let me go to Google Maps. Where is it here? And we'll go back here and we're in Kappa. In, where's the one in County Tyrone? Maybe it's this one. Is the right one? I think so. And you can actually go in here now. Let's see. And go here, plop the street view guy down, and look and see what the street now looks like. I love the street view on Google Maps. I mean, I, I, could, I can, can and have spent hours just exploring places where my ancestor lived or where I'm hoping to do a trip. Like I'm hoping to, when all of this mess is over to go to Nova Scotia to investigate the archives. So as I'm planning that trip, you know, I don't have dates because who knows when I'll be able to do it. But you know, I've sort of planned out my week and I've gone and looked at the street view but isn't that neat that you can then, and you can, you know, if you're looking, you know, these houses look more modern, but maybe we go out here and you can see some older houses and you can see what the land looks like. Isn't that great? Um, but yeah, this, I really like being able to do this because when you go from those books, um, the printed books that I showed you first for this, um, it's hard to figure out wh where within a, a, a parish somebody lived, but this helps you figure that out. And you can see here, there are areas that are forest and they're indicated. And I think if we even go to the modern map, look, some of these are still forested. I just, I'm, I'm a map geek, I admit it. Um, so, that will, um, and you can get the original, these printed ones. So here's Will, the, the ent entry at Ancestry for William Arthur. Um, so th those are there. Sometimes if, if you're looking, you, you can then go this way. You can find the person you're looking for and then go and look at who's around him. Um, and you'll see here, he's renting 
house offices and land from Samuel Galbraith. He's then renting out a house to Catherine Gallagher. And then you have him on another line where he is renting something called a mountain. There aren't really mountains in Ireland, so I don't know what that was. I'm wondering if it was actually one of those wooded areas. Although sometimes you'll say, it will say woodland. Um, so that's, that's the, what you can do with that. So let me stop sharing and go back to the PowerPoint. I know some of you aren't gonna be as, as excited over the maps as I am, sorry, but yeah. I hope to go to Pier 1, yeah, yeah, the, the Griff is this confusing because on a lot of land in Ireland, like in Scotland, you actually have three layers of people. You have the person who actually owns the land. You have the person who's rented from the actual landowner. And they've often rented an estate that will then have other houses that they've rented out to other people. And so you will get, um, that's why you will sometimes get weird combinations of who's renting what. So in that case, you saw how William Arthur was renting from Samuel Galbraith, but then he turned around and what, part of what he rented, he rented out to somebody else. And that's listed there. So let me bring up my notes side so I remember what I want to talk about. So, so that's Griffith's valuation. Oh, here's a slide showing the, that. Um, poor law records are not as easy to find as some things, but they are a wonderful source of information if you can find them. Um, before 1838, there wasn't much in the way of established poor law stuff in Ireland. It was mostly done by churches. Um, in 1838, which is right after England did this in England, they redid the system in Ireland, um, divided Ireland into 163 poor law unions. They, unlike Scotland, they did no outdoor relief. If you wanted help, you had to go live in the poorhouse. Um, and this system wasn't that off. I mean, it was awful for people. Um, there, you basically had to give up everything. Um, many workhouses had uniforms. Um, they separated men and women from each other. They separated children from their parents. It was not something you did unless your choice was that or starving. Which worked for 10 years until you get what in Ireland is called Angorta Moor or the Great Famine. Or actually, it's the Great Hunger in Irish, Angorta Moor, when the workhouses started overflowing. Um, and they did, about that time, establish outdoor relief. Um, because they were overflowing. Um, for Northern Ireland, the records from the poor law unions are at Crony. In the Republic of Ireland, they're in local hands, except County Mayos are at the North National Library of Ireland. You will get, um, if you find the records for your family, um, you will get birth dates, admissions information, um, gender, age, family relationships, what religious denomination they were, what townland they were from. You will also, there, there were punishments for breaking rules and those are recorded. Um, the estimate is that in the 1840s and early 50s, that somewhere up to about, and probably close to 25% of those admitted to a workhouse died within a year. Now, a lot of those were children who, you know, were getting not great nutrition and being worked hard and such. 
Um, but that's just so you, you know, it really was a, a source of last relief. Um, here is, oh, I have these out of order, dog license registers. So you can see you get the name of the owner, where they live, what they paid, it's a male or female dog, dog's color. Um, you get things like terrier, bull terrier, a, a water dog, um, and then the name of the dog. So it's a fun way to find out a little more about your ancestor. So here you see John Arthur, one of the, the brother of the Arthur I'm looking for, um, had one dog and paid um, a fee, which I think was actually two shillings, not two pounds, um, on a female water dog named Jess, who was had a who had black fur. So that's, but again, it puts this, this was in 1881, if I remember, or 1883. And so because there's no um, census for this time, you're looking for anything that lists people with a place. You know, it doesn't give us the nice relationships and all of that that um, you get from the census, but it's still a data point. So other records. There are police records. Um, over the last five years and leading up to the, um, their, the Republic of Ireland centennial in, in, in 2022, a lot of older records are going online, including a lot having to, you know, now that it's more than 100 years ago, they're willing to release some of the records about um, the Irish Civil War, the, 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 the rebellion, the Easter Rising, and all sorts of other police records um, for the criminal side. Um, and you also get court records out of that, which are in many cases online and usable. Um, you also get occupational records that are that were kept and um, especially for the police force and the post office. The post office is in Ireland is interesting. It does a lot more than the post office here does. Um, you can pay bills, you can do all it it almost functions as a bank as well and part of the reason for that is that at the time of, it was already well established at the time of the um, Civil War in 1922. And after the Civil War in the Republic of Ireland, it was really about the only nonpartisan functioning government organization that, and the only organization that really reached into all parts of the country. You know, almost everything else, schools, land things, all of that was politicized. Whereas the post office, now admittedly, some of this information is from my visit to the post office museum in Dublin. And so it's a little self-serving, but I think it, from what I've read in other cases, it is really true that they were sort of the, the one trusted institution that where it didn't matter what your religion or class, what your social class was. There are army records um, before 1922. Those who were Irish would have served in the British Army. Um, so you'll have to look through British Army records. Um, they're what are called the Great Estates Papers. Um, these are not wills, the way we think of as estates papers here. These are the huge landowners, the, the nobility, the gentry, um, at least upper middle class, usually upper class, you know, sometimes own thousands of acres, if not tens of thousands. And most of these are still in private hands and you have to write to that landowner's archives. Um, some of them have been deposited with National Archives, National Library of Ireland, and so on. Some of these great estate papers, it was actually a Scottish landowner who had land 
via the Ulster plantations. Um, and so some of the records, relevant records from Northern Ireland may actually be in Scotland. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And they, they will have lots of rent records, correspondence about problem tenants, um, lease details, and so on. Um, most pre-1900 wills were burned in 1922, but there were probate calendars that were printed each year, and those survive and are online. And they list the person who died, their address, their date of death, what court or jurisdiction proved the will, and who the, the executor of the estate was. You don't get that many deeds um, because people did not tend to own their own land. Um, like in that Griffiths valuation, even the person who was the, the lessor was in many cases a tenant of a bigger landowner. Um, and one last thing I want to talk about is names. Relatively small pool of names used, especially for first names. Some of the Many surnames were fairly localized. And this last one's from my personal observation of a week and a half of reading records at Prony. Um, if a person had a middle name in the middle to the, of the 19th century, they were probably 80% chance they were Presbyterian, 80% um, plus. I saw almost no Catholic or Church of Ireland baptisms um, or marriage records where a person had a middle name, but a huge, you know, almost half of the Presbyterians did. I don't know why the difference, um, but that's just a, a little thing to, that I noticed because I had very emphatically had, when I was looking for my Edward James Arthur, born about 1846, had the uh, person at the um, National Archives, the genealogy, they tell me definitively that there were no middle names in Ireland at that point. But by the time I went and looked at records at Prony, a lot of the Presbyterians had them. I will say this, Edward James Arthur probably turned out to be Church of Ireland and was an exception, but you know, that's my family for you. So this is the distribution um, of birth records for children named McGee in Ireland from 1864 until I think 1922. Um, someone did a study, you know, they digitized, you know, they, they computerized the data. And as you can see, there weren't many McGees down south. Middle of the country, there are a few, and then you get up to the northern part of Ireland and into Northern Ireland, and you get a lot more. Here you have the, for the surname Arthur. This is looking at the map on the left is the birth registrations. And you can see there's sort of three areas. You've got Northern Ireland, you've got some on the Dublin coast, and then another cluster here. This one um, is from the 1901 census. And it's not, this is absolute numbers. Um, you know, the bigger the circle, the more kids born with that name in that time period in that location. This is looking at the census in 1900 and the number of people per 100,000 who had that surname. So again, you see a cluster here, slightly smaller cluster here, and the biggest cluster up here, which is where, and you know, it's turning out that my Arthurs are right here straddling the, the Tyrone Donegal line. Um, so they're, again, making life difficult for me because Tyrone is Northern Ireland and Donegal is Republic of Ireland, which means the records are really in all sorts of places. Even a supposedly, you know, name like, you know, Irish name like Kennedy, this is looking at Griffith's valuation and where the Kennedys were and the, the bigger the blue spot, the more there were. And you can see there's a cluster up here, 
there's a little cluster here and here, and here's the big cluster. Now what's happening here, and the reason I chose this one instead of some other surnames, is most of these Kennedys in the north, or many of them, are actually going to be Scots Irish or Ulster Irish, depending on what you want to call them. Many of them are Protestants whose ancestors came from southern Scotland, whereas these Kennedys are the Irish Catholic Kennedys that gave us the US president. Um, and it's hard to tell in the middle. But just so you know that you, know, you do have some localized surnames. Here's Murphy. And this is um, the number of farmers per thousand population with the name. But you can see, so it's not, again, it's not absolute numbers, it's relative. But you can see that it's much more common in certain areas than in others. There's almost none of them here. You know, this is up the Belfast area, this is Dublin area. So this is between Dublin and Belfast and out west of Dublin. Um, but then down here in parts of Southern Ireland, you're getting um, parishes where you're getting 150 people out of a thousand to have the last name Murphy. Okay, so let me stop screen sharing and turn my video back on. Come on, there we go. So the dog licenses, um, they are at Ancestry, is either Ancestry or, fi it's Find My Past, sorry. Um, but again, as I said, Find My Past is a pay site, but you can buy one month's access. So if you get things organized, um, you can go ahead and get do everything online. Um, there are multiple places to get the surname maps. Let me get out of the PowerPoint. Um, and go back to here. Um, and needless to say, hang on, let me get things. Um, the right thing up. So let me share my screen again. So there are several places you can have them. At Grenham's site, you can do a couple um, searches and then it wants you to pay. Um, there are others, um, Barry Griffin's is really fun. Um, if you go to his website, um, let's close that out. Here we go. And you can put in a surname. And I'm interested, he used McGee as, as his example here. Um, instead of, so here's McGee in 1901, this is where I got that map, um, where you're looking at number of people with the surname per, per 100,000 for McGee, um, that is, um, you can see it's really concentrated, which you know, I was expecting because, you know, my couple greats grandfather had said he was born in Donegal, so this really doesn't surprise me that it's all up this way. Um, so yeah, so I just I just Googled um, Ireland's surname distribution map. And if you go into images from the Google search, you'll see some, and you, you, you can also try like here, if I wanted Kennedy, I could have done Kennedy surname distribution map, Ireland. Um, so I, I think I've used up the Grenhams for the day. So let's try, um, let's try Jameson just to see. They may want money. Yeah, see, I'd already used it. But again, you can do, I mean, this is 
five euros is about five dollars and fifty cents. This is maybe twelve dollars. Um, so if if and he's got a lot of other records on his site. So if you're starting to do your Irish ancestors, once you've got some stuff set up, it may be worth doing a a a one day or one month subscription. We do have his book at the state library. Several other libraries in Maine have it. It's the um, it's the best book out there on tracing your Irish ancestors. And I think it is, it's John Grenham, and I think it is just called Irish Ancestors or something like that, um, or tracing your Irish. I've got it sitting on my desk at home, my copy, or at the apartment rather than here. The poor law records are held, um, in Ireland, they are held by the local authorities still. Um, and are basically not online. County Mayo's are at the National Library of Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland are at PRONI, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. And my understanding is those are coming online sometime soon. I think Find My Past has some free stuff, but I don't know what it is. Um, I basically wait until I have enough that I want to look and I pay for a month um, because once I start looking I then have other things I end up wanting to look for because you know you find one answer and it raises two more questions um, start at the family search wiki for Ireland that's um, the other one is called Januki G E N U K I, and I think it's .co.gov or .co.uk, but it stands for Genealogy of the UK and Ireland. So if you Google Januki, it will come up, and they break everything down. And between, I have a handout that um, I will, as soon as our webmaster gets things set up for me, I will put the handout up. Um, because um, it's not quite in the shape I want it at the moment. Um, I got more absorbed in yesterday's conference than I expected and didn't get a chance to. <laughs> um, but 90% but of what you want to know to start with for Ireland, you will find either at Januki or at the Family Search Wiki which if you haven't already bookmarked the Family Search Wiki, Google FamilySearch.org Wiki, go to, the ho go to the overall page and bookmark it because it is the thing you should be using more than anything else as your starting point. Um, and for anywhere in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, England, Januki is going to be a good place to start as well. Um, both of those are crowdsourced to a great extent. So they are people like me going in and doing it out of, you know, obsession to update things rather than um, somebody paid. But you know, I happen to think that people like me doing that sort of thing are. Um, often as good as anybody else, you know, because we care about what we do. So that's that's just something. So those are the places I would start. Um, yeah, Legacy Family Tree may well have. And then the other thing is when you, if you know a county, Google that, Google the county name with genealogy. Because for a lot of the counties, there's a, there's a heritage center or a county archives that has information about what's available for the county. Um, and you have to remember, like in England, there are ways in which the counties act the way you, you know, they're partly what we would consider a county and partly what we consider a state for what they do. You know, they don't have their own laws the way states do here but as discrete record keeping units 
they're often more similar to states than they are to um, counties in the US, especially for those of us in New England where the county doesn't have much to do other than wills and deeds. Um, the issue is there's been an explosion of what's online for Ireland. And a lot of it is finding where it is because it's not all at Ancestry. It's definitely not all at Ancestry. And because of Ireland's history, finding where something is can be a little complicated. And so your search skills for finding resources will be almost as important as your finding skills within a resource collection or database for Ireland, much more than in parts of the US where you can just say, you know, for Massachusetts, go here. Um, or even in Scotland saying, you know, for this, go here. But because of the history and the division in 1922, um, there are some records that when they were microfilmed, they sent a copy in Dublin, they sent a copy to Northern Ireland and others where they didn't. And the other issue is the, the original province of Ulster had nine counties. Six of those are now in Northern Ireland and three are in Ireland, which means that, so for example, my whole Tyrone Donegal, there's literally a town on the border there between those two that if you walk through the town, it's like Lewiston, Auburn and Maine that if you don't know that crossing the Androscoggin River means that you've crossed into Auburn from Lewiston or vice versa because you didn't see the sign, it's the same thing. And so for a hundred years, those have been, those two towns have not only been two different towns, but they're two different countries and two different counties. And so um, I, I swear I have spent almost as much time tracking down where the records are as tracking down my record, my ancestors within the records. But the good news is that stuff is coming online. You know, 10 years ago and even five years ago, well, by five years ago, you were starting to get the boom. 10 years ago to do Irish research effectively, you almost certainly had to go to Ireland. And now you can do a good chunk of it at home in ways that you couldn't 10 years ago, that you could already do for a lot of the US and a lot of Scotland. Um, but you can't do it. You couldn't do it for Ireland. So any other questions at this point? Whoops, yes. Um, it, when the library opens again and you start having uh, groups, uh, training in groups, will you uh, have those online as well? Because for me, it, it, you have people from all over can watch yeah. it online. We're working on that. And whether I will do online at the same time I'm doing it in person, if I'll do one that evening for online, um, whether I will record the um, in-person version and post it at YouTube, but not do a Zoom meeting, so you won't have the same question ability. I don't know. I, I need to play, some of it's dealing with all sorts of complications, including whether I can get one of my coworkers to do some of the tech stuff while I talk in person. Because you know, here I'm able to kind of do it all by myself. Um, but as you can see, I still have some glitches and so if I'm doing it in person and managing the process in person where I do try to stop when people look confused and answer questions, um, 
I am committed and I talked to my, I went into the library on Tuesday and talked to my boss who, and this sort of thing basically lets me do what I want to do unless there's a reason otherwise. And I said, you know, I'm committed to continuing to do some genealogy programming online. Exactly how that shapes up um, in reality once we reopen. And as I said, I'm in the middle of putting together a survey um, that I'm gonna, I hope email out to you within the next week or two, because I would, you know, I would love to get some feedback about, you know, are the evening sessions working for you? What do you like about this format? If I put up just a video without the in-person meeting, would that be okay for you? Or do you like at least the limited interaction we can have this way? Um, so those of you watching um, the video of this, if you're not on my email list and you want to um, jump in on that discussion, get on the email list. Um, so let me um, stop the recording.